let's get rolling. So welcome everybody uh, to the Town Hall 47 Wednesday. Uh, let's move on to the next slide there. You know who we are. I'm gonna Hello. Got Mike and John here. Mikey, welcome. Thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, we have a fantastic guest this week. Let's uh, move on to the next one here. Look at that. <laughs> Check out how cool his hair is. He's so excited. Look at that. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to give him an introduction. I met this guy when I, you know, I very first uh, started in the industry and, and uh, was just uh, just getting used to even what was going on. And, and uh, uh, Jeff at the time was uh, kind of head of technology, I believe at Scimitar or that are working in that area and uh really kind of took me under his wing and was uh is that a high school, school yeah. year? <laughs> wow <laughs> you just get it from everywhere I, uh, but, but awesome. uh, for whatever reason uh jeff decided to befriend me and and uh we've been friends since but <laughs> what i learned about jeff very quickly was that um he has a, a sort of a vision for this for this uh not only the technology of this but what's needed in the industry and uh and i asked him today if he wouldn't mind coming on and kind of uh, help us kick off this series about sort of what's going on out there for everyone uh, in terms of the changes. Because one of the things we know is if everybody's going to change their business strategy, and, and Jeff and I had a, a, a short conversation about this yesterday, that means that Jeff has to, you know, people like Jeff who are running, you know, cores and things like that have to think about their, how they shift to adapt to that as well. And we, we just had a really good conversation about that. So uh, currently CTO of Correlation there from the beginning, I, I can remember visiting you when like no one was there. It was just you in a room, which I thought they were tricking you. I was like, you know, this isn't real, right? This is not going to be a thing. <laughs> this is, you fell for it again. Like that time you moved to Alabama, but <laughs> it turned out that that well, was- Well, John, John was nice enough to pay me to sit in a room, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess. But I remember that room, Jeff. Um, <laughs> the newspapers on the our sponsors, CUNA Council, uh, GAC's coming up this week. I don't know, is Tom O'Shea here? I think he's here. Yes, I, I got him on. Oh, there he is. Hey, Tom. Tom, that was a great conversation. I'm going to dive into that a little bit um, to talk to him about, you know, the, the partner portion of that. Um, but uh, we did uh, the GAC that's coming up. We, we pre-recorded the session with some CEOs that I thought was fantastic. Tom, I, it was I, great. I, yeah, it was really good. It was mm -hmm. really good. And I thank Tom for joining me on that. They said, do you know anybody? I said, I know someone who would be thoroughly helpful. And, and Tom was kind enough to join me. So I, 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 if you're uh, going to the JAC virtual event, I highly recommend check it out. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good session. Uh, so thanks to them, and obviously Mike and I and our companies. If you uh, if you're looking for work on your SDKs and things like that with your digital, we'd love to talk to you. If you're interested in voice, we'd love to talk to you. We don't know what Mike does, uh, <laughs> but we know he likes to talk to you. So we've got both sides of that happening. So, well, let's get rolling. So I'm going to set it up, and I'm going to set it up with Tom here, Jeff, real fast. So a couple things happened that I thought were very interesting out of the meeting we had. The first one I thought was interesting, Tom, was um, that people like uh, Mike Valentine was on the call. Uh, so was John uh, Janculius, uh, Crystal from GCU. And what I thought was interesting about what something they said was, I feel like they, they all said that, hey, we've now seen what's possible. Like we may have made a big mistake in the pandemic as IT people, by showing them that we could roll out everybody in the world to work from home in one day. Because I definitely heard the undertones of, well, now that I see what can happen if we focus. So I don't know that we're going to be buying some of these longer timelines. Would you agree with that, Tom? In terms uh, of what we're capable of? Yeah, I think nobody knows what the future holds. That's the biggest problem. Um, we're, and we're trying to predict consumer behavior through our own limited lens, which we can't do. I mean, it's just it's really hard to, uh, you know, to, to do that mind shift to get away from like, well, this is how we've done it. Now we can do all that stuff faster. Right. But now we actually have to swip, swivel a little bit, not even a pivot, just move over a little bit uh, to really understand what the consumer is doing and totally adjust our businesses. And, and one of the things that was discussed heavily was um, the pandemic really shook out a lot of partners. Like which oh, partners, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. you want to speak to that for a sec? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we found. And, you know, and just as for full disclosure to everyone, we are client number 22 of Correlation on Keystone back in February 2015. Just hit and six you, big years. Got my box you, of cookies from Correlation. And you Thank still you very talk much. to Jeff. See, that tells you something right there. I got lunch for a couple of weeks now. <laughs> um, but what we found, uh, uh, and I think I might have been the one driving part of this discussion, was 
the older line vendors that we all, all rely on were the most difficult to work with, the slowest to change, the slowest to adapt. It was the smaller, newer, younger companies that are really hungry to get out there that are the ones that are helping us to institute these changes and make them more, make them more permanent. And it's, it really was eye-opening on the bureaucracies and the set in their ways of, of some of these companies that just, you know, when their contracts are up, their time is up. Right. Well, and they couldn't move that fast. And that was, that was echoed by all the players in the room. Yeah. Um, and what I thought was interesting was we, we referred to this as it was the World Economic Forum that um, the guy who uh, the, the head of that that sort of coined this term that um, the Great Reset, you know, that this year mm -hmm. is a great reset. And the context we had was how is your business plan from February 2020 changed to February 2021? You know, if you look back at what your strategies were and in that one of the things I thought was really interesting and I was talking to Jeff about this is how does someone like correlation uh, uh, clearly a, a huge player in that space. How does someone like Jeff think about you and your needs with where we are right now? And I'm not sure we have all the answers, but this is a discussion about that. So without further ado, uh, you know, Jeff, I know I've given you some time to think about this topic. Well, you know, uh, particularly uh, you've got a customer right here and he's recording this. So, um, <laughs> you know, be careful what you say, but no, I, I, I'm interested in that thought. Like, Clearly, we need our vendors to sort of pivot with us. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, early on when, you know, before COVID, we even, we knew that technology was going to change, right? And so we had to adapt to it and make sure that we positioned ourselves to be able to change. Um, when COVID hit, it was like, it's changing right now. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, what are we going to do? Um, you know, just infrastructure wise, like you, you touched on, we were in the office on a Friday and then on a Monday, everybody's at home. And luckily we had the infrastructure in place to be able to support that, but we have to support our clients as well. Um, and that goes as far as having, you know, everything in place to be able to support them from a correlation perspective, but support their vendors as well, because they're going to be shifting. And, you know, we, we were lucky enough when we designed the system to be able to have a very robust API that um, some of our clients are taking advantage of right now to create products and solutions to be able to uh, help their members in this uh, unique new world that we're in. Yeah, the new normal. So let's ask a question of that. I think that's a great point. So are you seeing an uptick in API usage um, in terms of, you know, integrations that, because one of the, one of my kind of uh, things that I was noticing or my observations was that when more, when more focus was put on digital, when people who, and, and we talked about this in the webinar I had earlier today, this week, like first time users for banking. Uh, so, you know, there's all these digital services. There's only two industries where the first time users exceeded, uh, you know, like 45% of the normal user you know, membership. And it was, it was groceries and uh, banking. So that means that when the pandemic hit, we as an industry had, other than groceries, have more first-time digital users than any other industry. And so that was one thing we were talking about was that increased capacity put stress not only on Tom's, say, digital systems, but on the core as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, we saw an uptick on, on hits through our, our API, which all of the vendors use and mm -hmm. um you know it, it it it's it didn't it didn't affect us but we definitely saw the strain that some other the some of the other vendors were ha having right um you know if they weren't ready for it you know then yeah if you were if you were running at like a margin of like 20 percent extra expecting that that would be your peak right it blew right past that for a lot of people oh big time big time yeah. I mean, we, we saw a major uptick, but um, those vendors, they had a huge strain on the home baking side, even the audio side, where they were getting just hammered because people, it's the life we're in now. People don't leave home as much, right? Yeah. Well, and, and so the other observation that uh, I was noticing, and Kevin and I were talking about this, was 
that these first time users were experiencing or sort of pointing out holes in the digital services <laughs> that I feel like now have become part of the strategy for the future. I'll give you an example. Um, I have a lot of people approaching us about writing, and you and I were discussing this about writing SDKs for card control um, and also real time payments. So I guess, you know, and, and I've known this and it's something you and I have discussed many, many times. Uh, we all kind of had these real time credit card wishes but now that that's the only way to make your payment. And since they were doing it over the counter for so long and they weren't used to that not being available. So they'd go in and make a payment, I guess, and I guess walk right out of there, and go to the next place and use their credit card to buy something. And when they did it online and that didn't work, it was a dysfunctional experience for them. And so Tom, what we were talking about was you have now, those maybe not, those, those areas where there were gaps weren't as high of a priority but now they kind of are. Is that kind of what we were hearing from your perspective, yeah. Tom? Yeah, uh, raising table stakes and, and saying, you know, the basic check image capture, you know, that's yeah. all well and good. But now we've got to add some intelligence to that to release that, that hold as sooner than we might have otherwise. Or a cash ATM deposit, I think was one example I used. Uh, yeah. You know, that's got a hold on it. And by, by law, we can, we can do that. But you know, you should not have to do that. Yeah, if I've been a member for 50 the, years. Right, right, right. So you need the yeah. technology. Somebody, yeah, somebody's got, uh, you know, $2,000 a week coming into their checking account and they deposit a $50 check they got as a birthday gift. Where's the risk? Right. Well, you know, but but, we have to be but, able to do that and then say, right. okay, that person, they get it and this person doesn't. And that's a great example of a solution. So Jeff, there's a great example. And, and, and let me just paint this picture. So Mike Lawson, is used to going into the branch or driving through the drive through and giving them a check because they know Mike Lawson and they've seen him a hundred times. Mike Lawson drops off that $80 check from his grandma that we all know he, he, he cashes. And uh, like Seinfeld, he saves them up and then runs around the money. But um, so he, he cashes that check and because they know him, they give it to him right away. But now that's not available to him. So he uses one of the two next best things, either the ATM or the mobile and he does not get access to it. And he doesn't understand at all why if you do it the one and the other, doesn't make any, I mean, look at him, he's old. He, he doesn't have any clue as to why the dysfunction is. So is that a core problem? Is that a switch problem? Like Mike, how do you, or pardon me, Jeff, how do you address that? What are you, what are you thinking there? Well, <clears throat> I think there's some legacy kind of logic in there. Yeah. Um, it's not API driven. So you don't have as much uh, availability to what you might have gotten on the teller line. Yeah. And that's, that really comes down to, um, you know, I, I, just, I hate to put, put the onus on somebody, but, um, you know, it, it's just an older technology going through a switch. We ha definitely have a ton of controls in our system that can be able to support that, but we can't control what's outside our ecosystem. Right. And so are you seeing the vendors like suddenly show up? Hit, you and I were talking, I know the answer to this because you and I already talked, but suddenly you're having this sort of drift of vendors who are showing up trying to shore this stuff up. And you're seeing that, that, uh, you're seeing that, um, that push on your side, like a lot of people asking a lot of questions they didn't ask before about the APIs and not, not necessarily understanding those more complex features, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're starting to see, you know, you, you, you touched on it before they're seeing the traffic, right. Um, especially with the home baking vendors, when they're seeing the traffic hitting, um, they're starting to see, see latency. Right. Um, that's, that's a huge issue. Uh, latency in a digital world is, is a killer. It's death. Yeah. Well, it's like, I always tell the story of if you went to the branch three times and two out of three times, you couldn't get in, would you go back, keep going back? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the same thing, like you give up, you know, and, and in digital, the, the two out of three is actually being pretty nice. Usually they'll try once and, you know, but they won't, but what's funny is they won't go and post or call you. They'll just go, those guys suck. I'll find something else. Exactly. You know? They'll go somewhere else. And that's what we don't want. We right. want, we want to keep them. Um, and we're, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever we can to keep them. But um, when you're at the, when you're at the mercy of somebody else, sometimes it's hard. So you guys have a unique business model. You know, if I look at the other cores and the other systems that are out there, they are they are a constellation, no pun intended, of systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, they generally, uh, say a Fiserv, um, will have 
their own home banking or their own products that uh, theoretically, I guess, if I'm them, um, I would guess out of just my own mental brain working is their products theoretically should work better with their other, it's like, it's like saying, hey, I, you know, I've got a Toyota car and, you know, I don't think a Nissan engine will work so well in it. I probably could make it work, but I probably should just use a Toyota engine and probably should buy a Toyota compatible radio if I'm going to swap it out. But, but you guys don't take that approach. You, you're focused on one thing, right? So, so I, I think that differentiates you in a bit because that gives you a lot more time to look at the API. If, if, if you're not trying to build a mortgage system or integrate your own mortgage system, then that effort I would imagine would go into being more open and, and uh, building out the API, right? Absolutely. I mean, our API is the same one we use for our user interface that we give to vendors. So um, the same at the same uh, on the same note, we'll work with any vendor our clients see value in. Right. Uh, we don't we don't have home banking. Even big, big. you even let idiots like us in. We'll even work with big. We can yeah, we even work with big. I mean, that says a lot right there. Yeah, yeah. You be, if you're willing to let us connect our five. I, I, the, one of my great stories was when we first started, um, I needed to connect something and Jeff didn't hesitate. He, he, uh, he let us connect and it was, it was really nice of him. We didn't really have any customers at the time, and, but it was easy to do and, and that was important. But really the other thing is you don't have a competitor, right? So if someone brings you checking or a, a bill pay solution, you're not really thinking, oh, well, I don't want to give them too much autonomy in that bill pay solution because that would maybe displace ours right oh absolutely i mean we give them full functionality right and if 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 one of our clients sees value in in a solution um we're going to make that happen uh we have we have solutions in the core we have los in the core we have collections but if they want to go outside that we'll still work with those other vendors mm -hmm. because that brings value to our clients Sure. And, and, and that's important to us. Uh, we right. want to make sure that they have choices. We want to make sure that they bring the best thing for their members to the table. Well, and, and not limit them by the API. So let's get exactly. back to the discussion here. So, so Tom is suddenly going, hey, I'm not so focused on branches. And now some <laughs> things for me that weren't, not that he ever was focused on branches. Um, one of the, one of the uh, CEOs on the call, she gave us this, uh, this mantra that she's been sharing with her team. When Cortez landed the ships in the Bahamas, he burned all the boats, which apparently sent a tiny message to the people he brought with him that maybe they weren't leaving via those boats. And so her point is, we're not going back. We're not going back on work from home. So as Tom shifts his business strategy, as Tom says, hey, I'm going to need, say, solar lending, um, I'm, you know, because asset classes are going to diminish. Maybe people aren't buying as many cars. Um, how do you guys respond to that? Like, you know, as you look at and talk to your teams and, and, and work with them. You okay? Yes. Okay. Tom? Or, oh, uh, for Jeff, me? You yeah. Was you that for me or Tom? That was for you, Jeff. Okay. Oh. We were a little so worried about when, you though, because you I thought you froze or pretended to freeze. Maybe you just want to answer the question. You know, I was catching that. up on I was catching up on chat. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, when we see new opportunities like that, I mean, um, we just really try to reassess what, uh, what's the important things to, what's the important things to uh, focus on. Um, we can't do everything for everybody. I mean, nobody can. Uh, but at the same time, when, when, if Tom O'Shea comes to us and says, hey, we got this new product, we need to bring this to, to the table. Um, either we, we, we decide if we're going to put it in the core or we could build tools outside the core to be able to script things, to be able to uh, get them time to market quicker. So your internal meetings, as you guys are looking at this type of this, this shift, so would, would it be fair to say that if we feel like the in-person branch sort of thing isn't going to be as strong as a play, then a more effort would be put into opening up those features and APIs, or, or do you shift altogether and start looking at uh, you know future plans that maybe you had longer down the road and accelerating them and you and I were talking about some of that you said you had some some points well yeah that. I mean when, when COVID hit we accelerated a couple things um we we knew there were certain things that our our clients wanted to bring to the table as far as skip a pays and and things like that so 
we put together a program for that uh, right away. Um, we had some things in the works for uh, biometrics and authentication. Um, those were important uh, when we when we got about you know a couple of weeks into COVID. We realized people don't want to touch anything. They don't want to. <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to pull their masks down. Right. Um, right and things like that. So we accelerated some development with uh, member pass so that you can uh, people can authenticate through their, their yep. cell phones. So whether you're, touch, so whether you're at the teller line or you're at home, you know, uh, there's, there's no need to be able to uh, get out of the new, <laughs> the yeah. new rules as far yeah. as touching anything. And because back then you couldn't even get hand sanitizer, but right. um or toilet paper, but that's all that. How did you address the toilet paper system thing with your system? Never mind, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, every now and then I just got to throw Jeff a softball. Um, <laughs> but but that's a great point of I'm reacting to that. So what other future plans now that this is kind of hitting this new model? For example, you called me after a meeting we had. It was kind of the impetus for me asking you to join us. Um, where I was talking about the vaccine cards and, and I posed the question, the positive question in the meeting, it does it make sense to track members as to whether or not they've been vaccinated given where we are? Could that be something that's important? And you said, you know, I think if they did want to, I'm set up for it, but, or I could be set up for it very easily. But that was the kind of thing where we were sort of just, you and I were brainstorming, but were there already other things like that that people need that, you guys have shifted your business plan to say, yeah, we're going to accelerate some of these other things. I think skip a pay was a wonderful point on that. I'm sure you had to do some stuff with PPP as well uh, oh, yeah. to, to help deal with that. So what else is in the books that, that you guys are looking at? Well, I can't say too much because I hate to give too much out of the bag before it's well, Tom will hold you to it down yeah, the road. I know Tom's going to hold me to it. So absolutely. Yeah. And, and Andrew over here. So uh, don't, don't, don't just ignore Andrew. He's usually in a stadium somewhere, but he did survive <laughs> COVID. So we do give him credit for that. And we're glad you're back, Andrew. I'm glad to see you doing well. Um, but no, whatever you can share. I don't want you to give away anything. No, we're, we're really focusing on digital right now and how can we bring more, more options to the table? Um, you know, we, we are very much of an integrator. Um, right. We do core, we do core pretty well, we feel, and that's our core competency, but mm -hmm. um, you know, that's we're, we're core relations, core relations. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we're, we're looking at what, what can we bring to the digital channel? that might be able to bring value to our clients and in turn to their members. Um, like more traditional things that are not generally exposed, you know, in the, in the self-service type of arena that are going to have to be, if we're going to move more in that way. Oh yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking for a ways to, to extend our CRM, our, our cross sell, our collections, all of that to the external channel so that it, everything can be more self-service. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we have an API that does that. Um, anybody can take advantage of it, but it's just a matter of who's going to, who's going to take that leap and, and take advantage, or do we have to go ahead and review expanding what core means to us? Cause we always, you know, core, core to us means more, means a little bit different things. Core means different things to everybody. Right. Um, we put a lot of, a lot of emphasis in the core and every time we extend the core, we extend our API. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of who's going to be able to take advantage of that. So we're- well, And it's not trivial. You and I were discussing the difference between an API and an SDK. Right. And that's- Who uses something... it the right way. Yeah, because not a lot of people understand those differences. You know, uh, just if so everybody knows. An API is like uh, an interface. Let's say that you were using- um, well, this is a great question for Mike. We'll get to that in just a minute. But an API is an interface that allows you to take a service and basically put it into your solution. So if I had Twitter and I wanted to add a, uh, the weather into my, my tweeting service, I could go get an API to the weather channel, bring back the weather and display it inside Twitter. But the way I'm doing it inside Twitter is actually through the SDK. So the software development kit allows me to extend the Twitter platform and reach out to another API. So those two things go hand in hand. But I feel like you and I were talking that's kind of one-sided. Um, you definitely have the API, 
but uh, and these other companies have the SDK, but they're not kind of there's a lot of rhythm there that still sees a lot of orchestration synchronicity that needs to happen. And that leads to the latency issues and other things because they just don't have an understanding of that. Um, and so you you seem to be correcting that. That's what I've seen from you guys is, hey, even if they're, even if we're not the problem, we're still going to fix it is what I'm hearing from you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we'll definitely work with our clients and to our vendors to try to fix the <laughs> You know, we talked about the latency issue. That's been one that's just oh yeah. Um, methodology don't load ten days of history every time someone logs in. That's just a cardinal rule of home. Yeah, when you try to load twelve months of history for five shows loads, people, yeah. when you when every one of them logs in on a first day live, I mean that's going to be interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun to watch. I do enjoy it. Yeah, that. and then the yeah. SDK really puts it into your. It, it, it builds some extra controls to be able to to not allow them or allow bad integrations at times. Right. And that's important, um, especially when you're working on high traffic. And we're talking about an age where traffic is obviously higher than ever before. Yeah, for I mean, it's, it's been the biggest movement. Well, it also prevents you from doing things maybe you shouldn't do because one of the, one of the great things about your API is this is so open, but then that also brings the Spider-Man paradigm, right? With great open API comes great responsibility. Great responsibility. <laughs> right. So it is that Tom can do the thing where he gives people, um, you know, very individualistic, uh, individualized um, whole patterns depending on their relationship. But because it's set up to do that, someone could take advantage of it if you don't, or if bad programming could lead to allowing someone to take, you know, to, to cause fraud. Yeah. And even on our side, I mean, even if if we're responding on a, on a reasonable level, you know, there's always that latency on the back end, right? Would mm -hmm. the consumer, when I mean consumer, I mean the consuming system. Right. Um, Not know. the member. You, you know, you're, you're creating your lingo. We know. <laughs> um, so let me, let me throw one other thing at you. And then I want to open it up some questions. So one thing that I've always thought is missing, and you and I've had this discussion before is I think the future revolves around this customization niche work. And by the way, Tom, if that was not the message of that meeting, I don't know what was, right? Yeah, is everybody's right. trying to be more niche. Everybody's trying to differentiate themselves by being more niche to the members that they have. And so one way to do that, that I just do not see a platform for is member preferences. So I'll give you some examples. Um, many years ago, Mr. Sarber, uh, who you may remember from visiting at, at WRG, who is now the president of BIG, uh, insisted that we never ask anybody more than once whether they speak English or Spanish. Um, and so we had to do that. And we didn't really have a place for that. And that's when I realized that preferences, member preferences in general, need a home somewhere. I think the core is the ideal place to do that. And let me give, let me give you some examples. I think as integration gets more and more, we're gonna see like, for example, you talked about being touchless. Um, you know, uh, a gas pump, for example. I think that down the road as we see, and this is way future, not tomorrow, but like I like to think three, five, seven years out, you know me. So storing like the type of gas that you want, or maybe even having that rewards number that goes with the gas, so I'm not pressing all these buttons every time. Like I see that as like something that all these different systems are gonna need so that they can defer the language so that they understand the right time to communicate. You, you just talked about, I thought something really cool was extending your CRM out to the rest of the channels. Um, because if we're not gonna go visit branches, we're not gonna get rid of human contact. We're gonna need appointments. And is that kind of what you were talking about was using your system to centralize that? And what do you think about this member preference idea? Well, well, let me talk on the, the CRM piece. Yes, we want that extended to everybody. We wanna be the repository. We have one of our clients, uh, PSCCU, when they came on board, they used our CRM to um, categorize every contact. And based on those contacts, they were able to make business decisions on how to serve their members better. A great example was they had too many, too many people were calling to change their password um, online. There was a mechanism for it, but they, for some reason, they weren't using it. So they reevaluated based on the number of hits they had, calls for that, and then they, they changed the website. 
And then that went down, then they took the next one. So based on the CRM, they're categorizing, but you need one spot to hold all that stuff. You can't have silos. You can't have a CRM in one spot and another and try to sync about it. It's never going to work. Well, and the dysfunction, like we just talked about, of one channel allowing you to have a five thousand dollar instant, uh, you know, instant issue on the deposit, and another channel that seemingly to the member for no reason, not understanding the risk of digital, um, will only give you three hundred dollars available. Yeah. Well, those are two. You know that 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 um, that 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 sort of uh, dysfunction between two systems. Members just if they're not. It doesn't make any sense to them, especially first-time members that are coming in. So, so the idea the that you could extend that out to everything makes sense. Yeah, and then the preferences, I definitely think that's huge because your preference on one platform is going to be the same preference on another platform. Right. And yeah. so you need a central repository for that information. Yep. Um, you know, we've done that. Um, we have we have clients that have unique preferences. Um, and they could tailor the preferences to the individual member and display that at whatever level they want. And, and the, the important thing is that you don't want to push your members to ask, to answer the same question multiple times mm -hmm. when you're dealing yeah, with like, an individual institution. Right, like the Spanish question, which was a great example. But I think that preferences is going to extend into more AI. And, and again, I, this is all just, you, you're getting sort of an example of if Jeff and I hang out and have a beer or two, <laughs> where our conversation goes but because they're not only going to be things that the members put in their preferences but they're going to be things we learn yeah. based on their behaviors and the problem is those are too far out in the edge processing to be used as a centralized piece so yeah andrew's got a system that is learning these things but it, but that information isn't making it over to these other channels which is now becoming a problem because we have so many people who are diversifying their channel space. So they might be using the ATM a bit and they might be using the, the mobile banking and they, and they may be calling in and they're starting to see the dysfunction of the three. I, I well, think there's you know, huge value in, in synchronizing those. Absolutely, if somebody's coming in to cash a check every week you know, and uh, into a branch, um, extend that knowledge out to the home banking vendor to say, hey, let's do Tell her, let, let's do, you know, check yeah. capture from, and, and the, from home base. And the core, is, the core has always been, I think, the proper place, the system of record for that, but only if it's designed that way. Um, there are a lot of cores that are designed to sort of be ancillary and to be a GL system. And then there are third party CRMs and things like that. But I do think there's value in extending that out, particularly in the appointment play. Um, so let's, let's jump over to Mike's question. So Mike asked about commercial banking. Uh, which I think is a fascinating concept, particularly with PPP and what's going on. Uh, and I know something dear to Tom because it's, it's certainly part of his portfolio to, it, to some extent with the medallions and whatnot. Talk a little bit about how you shifted in that regard because small businesses are definitely suffering uh, and, and folks like Tom definitely want to help them. Uh, how are you guys seeing that pro progress and what have you changed and accelerated there? Well, uh it took us a while from our inception to be able to get to the point to support, be able to support commercial banking. Right, yeah, it's um, not an easy trick. It's not an easy trick. Um, we did onboard some large clients that had pretty good portfolios and they wanted to get off their other third-party systems. So we partnered with them to be able to uh, support more commercial functionality. We've always had some, we call it functionality. We don't call it a module because it's just part of the system. Right. Anybody on the system could have that functionality. You can extend it out to your, your commercial individuals as well. And, and by doing that, you don't have to have a separate CRM for commercial. Exactly. It's all one system. So it's all tied together. Um, yeah. Over time, we've really noticed that, um, you know, people are starting to buy into more of the small business banking, things like that. Um, so we just partner with our clients and we continue to extend that functionality. When when COVID hit, you know, we did some minor changes for PPP loans. Um, we also uh, extended out, you know, like I said, the skip a pays, but that also goes out to uh, the mortgage, uh, mortgage well, that's, loans. That that's another good example of a centralized uh, system, right? Yeah. Skip a pay went across the board. And we didn't have to touch a bunch <laughs> of systems. So <clears throat> as our clients bring us additional functionality that they're looking for, um, you know, we're going to listen to it. Commercial, Commercial is kind of interesting right now. Um, 
just because there's so many businesses going going out of business. Yeah, which is unfortunate. But um, we're trying to we're trying to focus on whatever we can do to make sure that they get the functionality they need to to be able to stay in business. Let's let's do the quick wins to get through this, and then uh, focus on the big hits after that. I agree. So before I get to the questions, was there anything I didn't ask that you wanted to cover real fast? Because I'm gonna I, I want to and I, when we go to the questions, I want to tell everybody. While Jeff is the CTO for for correlation, he's also one of the most brilliant technology guys I've ever met. And so I would encourage you to basically ask him about almost anything. I mean, it, I, and I know he'll answer. I know he, he doesn't mind answering sort of like futuristic questions like AI and because we talk about it a lot and what we see coming down the pike. So I would encourage those types of questions. But before we go, was there anything I didn't cover that you wanted to cover? That wasn't for Tom, it's for you. <laughs> the question's coming up. <laughs> yeah, I'll wait for the questions. Okay. Well, let's have some questions. Go ahead, Tom. I see you've already got one. So, uh, Jeff, where do you see uh, cloud computing in the future for credit union processing? You know, we're all Great on question. we're all on boxes that are in a data center that we own and control and secure. At least we think theoretically we yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, but now we're seeing, you know, uh, Google Cloud, AWS, all these other services. What's the likelihood or capability uh, or or concerns, I guess, uh, we would all, all have if we looked at cloud computing? Um, that's a great question. Uh, that's something that we've thought about quite a bit. <laughs> um, made some leaps and bounds last year that would support that. Um, we've always supported a private cloud. Um, the pri or, or We've always supported the private cloud, but the public cloud is a scary thing, I think. And I think the biggest, the biggest concern would be regulatory issues. Um, you, you know, you're, you're sending, credit unions have always been very, they always hold their systems very tight mm -hmm. and very secure. Um, you know, in the past, everybody was in-house, mm -hmm. but over time, they started going out to these private clouds. And now the public cloud is so huge, people are really looking at it. I think it's only a matter of time till we make that leap. There's already government agencies on AWS and Azure. Um, there, Capital One, Capital One moved everything to AWS like four years ago. Yeah, and it's just a matter of time till till credit unions do the same. So I think we need to be ready for it. Um, and I think it's just going to be a matter of time till one person does it, and then it's going to be a big, a big, a big domino effect. Yeah, but because your core. I mean, frankly, you're the newest core in the market. I mean. There, in terms of technology, you are the, I think, the newest right now. There might be a few that are out there that are, but in terms of the credit market, you're number one in terms of the age of your system. I would think that your system could easily run in today's cloud-based environments, particularly IBM's, um, oh. IBM's uh, uh, Blue Cloud. And then I also would say that the, there's a likelihood that a great number of the vendors that Tom works with and, and other cranes work with are already in the cloud that are accessing your API. Is that a true statement? Absolutely. There's a lot of home banking vendors. They're running in the cloud. Um, they're accessing our system directly already. So in uh, some ways, there's kind of already this, you know, it's kind of like... They already put their toe in the water. Yeah, that that the ship has sailed a little bit. Yeah. In that the API is already connected to the cloud. I mean... Yep. You and I both know that it's not any. It's it's like saying, "Hey, it's like have you seen these commercials where like Bobby's studying math with his dad, and Bobby is a he's doing trigonometry. Oh yeah, and Bobby and his dad have been smoking for the last <laughs> six hours because you know have you seen this where they're talking about people vaping and smoking? That cloud thing is kind of like that in that if you're connected via the API, you kind of kind of almost are in the cloud already to some extent. Uh, the API without some sort of uh, you know, it, it's extending that functionality out. It doesn't mean that it's insecure. It just means that some of that put, you're, I would suggest you have more than a toe in the water at that point. Yeah, you got a whole foot. Um, you got a foot maybe those, up to the knee. Some of those connections out to the cloud, they're not just an API connection. They're not just a pass through. They're storing data too. Yes, and they got data out there as well because exactly. they realized the latency and what, well, that Jeff guy, he's jerky. He won't let me pull 12 months of data every time I log in. So I better start storing that over here. 
And you should know if that's being stored. Because, you know, going back to your regulatory point, Jeff, um, did you know that, you know, you've got AWS, these kinds of guys. And when you look, they have all these different things. They'll say AWS East, AWS West. You also have AWS Canada. Yeah. If you move your, and by the way, you're one click away from taking a database and just putting it in Canada, yep. which would be illegal on behalf of us in the NCOA. But yep. you could do it. You could you could do it so easily it wouldn't even be funny. So I think it's a great question, um, but I do think uh, I think you're on the right track. But I guess what I'm hearing from you is, I think you could probably. I, my guess is you could support it today. I, I I'm pre pretty sure I could run your. I know a lot about your system. I think I could run it in the IBM cloud in the Watson cloud in particular. We're we not even the IBM cloud. We're we're running a, a demo database that we created. No member data. It's just. Mm -hmm. Just Andrews, right? It's just a bunch of Andrews and Tom O'Shea data. Right, right. Um, that's and that's fair game. And uh, yeah, they no signed problem. that secret NDA that they didn't know about, right? But we're running on AWS right now. Yeah, so it's it's possible. It's absolutely possible. And by the way, does it make good sense to run? Here's a great example of moving into that space. It's something I encourage people to do. Is if you want to move into the cloud and see what it's like, start with your dev systems. You know, start with the ones that don't have any member data. There is money to be saved there, I think. And the other thing is, and we have a problem with this. We have a problem called QA, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, theoretically, the way you save money in the cloud, because you don't save money in the cloud unless you do this, is you have to shut those systems down or turn off resources when they're not being used. Um, nobody does that because uh, I asked the crazy, I'm like, I'm like, hey, we could shut down your, your QA or your, your dev stuff. And they're like, no, we can't. If we shut down the dev system, people will kill us. And what I realized was the reason for that is they don't have a true QA. So the people who are doing QA are credit union people and they have to do it outside their normal jobs, which means they're hitting it at night. They're going home and testing. And you, you and I have been on the other end of that, Jeff, how many times? Yeah, when Susie gets home, she's gonna run the test because today she's doing this or whatever, or Bob or Tom or whoever. But what that means is that system has to be on full time. So it's sort of a resource piece. But if you could move those things with no member data to the cloud, it is a good way to check that out and could theoretically be cost effective. We might be doing that right now. I don't know. You don't know? Like, you think the Koreans are probably doing it for you? or you just <laughs> No, we've um, talked about uh, transitioning dev environments out there. And then yeah. also our environments for our third party vendors to get certified with our API. Yeah, because there's um, no member data on them. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, there's no, there's no re reason not to. Um, yeah. It makes total sense. And then we could also, in the cloud, you could also spin up individual environments for each of those different vendors, um, as opposed to sharing an individual environment on our side. Um, yeah. it, it's, these are conversations that we've had and we know we can do. It's just a matter of time till we, we decide to do it. Because we're, like you said, we're not dealing with member data on the dev environments. Um, neither, you know, our you, clients yeah. don't need to either. They can use a, dem a demo environment as well. Um, so it makes total sense. And then you could just spin up whatever environments you want and kill them when you want, when you don't need them. Well, and also you can reset them, which is a really important thing when you're doing de de development demo. Um, so, and testing in QA. So Cody has a question. Uh, Cody is a longtime friend of mine and uh, he does a lot with uh, what used to be corporate one and uh, he says, how do, how, how do you slash we as credit unions have control on FinTech partners accessing the API is not going rogue? How do you keep it from going? So like, and please try to be very detailed. I'd like to, last time we had a meeting this past week, we almost killed Tom because the lady said she broke into a credit union using the CCTV outside the credit union. So we don't have a defibrillator right near him, but if you can get him to pass out, there's bonus points. So go ahead. So I think with the APIs, you always have to have good controls. You don't have a completely open per API. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very we have a completely open API that's controlled by very um, granular par uh, parameters. Right. And those parameters are controlled by our credit unions. So Tom O'Shea could go in there and say, "Hey, I don't want my home banking vendor to go look at." Um, director accounts collections or something. yeah collections or run batch jobs or anything like that uh, you have to have controls around any api um if, if you don't like like cody said it's going to be completely open and they could go completely rogue um at, at the same time there's always the the 
there's always the case of controlling number of accesses mm. or traffic. Um, mm. You know, that, that's, that's more difficult because you never know if it's really needed or if it's not. Um, well, and it adds latency too. Yeah, um, it adds latency. So one thing I'll, I'll, I'll jump into, we were talking to uh, Alyssa Knight who does uh, credit union um, penetration testing, but also like for Tesla and stuff like that. Yep. And she's broken into cars and whatnot. Um, one thing that uh, I've been saying for a long time, but she really crystallized was um, one, when we talk about authority as it relates to APIs, she was able to hack 30 credit union mobile apps in one like week. week. Remember, Mike, were you on that call? Because it caught Mike's attention, yeah. So that's when Tom O'Shea really did pass out. Um, he literally just <laughs> like, the tail off his guy. chair and just boom. He was and checking he, to see if it was his app. <laughs> right, and she even said, I moved money, I did the whole thing. And the way she did it was, and is a lot of these applications, because no one's watching them from the credit union side, um, will get what we call a super user. They'll use that super user to authenticate, you know, Jeff, but then make all their other calls using this super user. So that, yeah, Jeff's good. So theoretically no one could sort of ship, but she was able to go in with the token using the, the JWT, which is the, the a token that's used commonly in web services. That token is supposed to tie you, Jeff, to only his records, but, it's, but some APIs don't support that or some programmers don't do a good job of it. So she was able to take that token and go, well, let me see if I could pull Bob's account with it or Tom O'Shea's account with it. And sure enough, she could. And so then she figured out that that particular vendor had 30 credit unions. So then she checked, you know, she went through and said, okay, let me contact them and see if it's okay if I take a look at this. And sure enough, she could hit them all. And so that was systemic to the software because that version had been poked out. So what she, what she concluded was that a lot of us that are using signature-based firewalls, which has been a thing for a while, I said for a long time, hackers are gonna start using AI. Well, that's already happened. It started with the state sponsor hackers and now we're seeing it with just the normal guys who wanna steal money. Um, our control systems, and they make ones that are specific for monitoring an API, and I've seen them in place with your product, um, FireEye is an example, where they will monitor the behavior of that API and they'll look for those anomalies in a way using machine learning and AI type features that would catch someone who's using that token to jump around. But you can't do that with a signature base. Signature base is kind of out the window. So Cody, uh, another thing is we're all gonna have to continue to up our security. And I think we just did a big paradigm shift because more people on digital equals more targets, more targets equals more hackers, more opportunity. And we've got to step up that spot. So if there's anybody who's really looking at advancing your digital agenda, make sure that you're advancing your products and services. Cause it's not really Jeff's, you know, I, I don't see it as the core's um, responsibility uh, to him. You know, he, you can't have it both ways. You can't have Jeff be completely open and give you all these great options. And at the same time, expect him to somehow limit what's going on with the vendors. You got to trust them or not, but one way to help I think lock that down is to get these new tools like the AI firewalls that can monitor actually API interfaces, XML, those sorts of things um, specifically. A great example would be, hey, I've seen 3,000 you know, 3, packets go by that look with this particular JSON, which no tool looks down at that level. But this one, this is the first time I've ever seen that. Uh, I'm gonna raise an alert, I'm gonna do something. And so, you know, and it learns behavior. It's different than a signature. A signature says, this is how I attack you. It's like saying, I, I, I'm monitoring a hallway with a camera and people with, I know that people who wear uh, blue ski masks are gonna likely to steal. So that's my signature. If I see one, I'll let you know. Whereas monitoring a hallway to say, I'm looking for the behaviors and anomalies of things that might indicate that someone is doing something out of scale or out of scope is important. So I just defend you a little bit there, but I, I think that's more important. And I think, I think it's important. I, I think that's a great point. And when you're talking about doing packet sniffing and things like that, um, you have to be careful and make sure that you invest in the right tools because you could become a bottleneck. Yep. And, and yeah, those things up. can slow you down. It and needs those to be things a camera can really slow you down. And you, you got to make sure they're configured appropriately. So I, I would just make sure that you invest appropriately on those kind of tools. 
Well, it, it needs to be a camera and not a turnstile. Yeah. You know, I, and, and we've seen both models. Uh, yep. Turnstile will slow it down significantly. A camera just lets people walk through. Who else has a question for the, the magnificent and amazing Jeff Dan? If I butter him up enough, he gives me free stuff. So just saying. <laughs> Andrew, you got something? Yeah, I do. Uh, um, it might be more correlation specific, but um, so uh, Tom, we're number 97. Uh, so, uh -huh. so you're 48. So I'm always going to be half your age, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, oh, by the way, Jeff, uh, Scotch doesn't say, taste the same when you can't smell. It's horrible. Yeah, COVID uh, is killing the Scotch industry. I heard that. Uh, uh, now, my first question: um, I mean, have you seen? You know, we had the question there from Cody about the uh, um, the, the APIs going rogue, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we had we had a vendor who, um, you know, they're initializing and uh, and closing the session for each transaction. Right? It was causing multi you know, latency and timeouts and things like that. Um, have you seen that? Because that's kind of like an old school approach, you know, rather than like rather than an API approach, you just have the open session initiate it, and then basically you don't have to reinitiate it until it reboots, right? Um, have you seen any like kind of horror stories and things like that with vendors where you're just like, what were you thinking? Well, the worst is when they open a session, they don't close it, and they open another session, and they just fill up fill up the queue, right? And then you can't have any more sessions because one of them has to time out. Well, so, you only have six, six. You only have an availability of sixty-five thousand five hundred thirty-five sessions based on thirty-two bit. Yeah. yeah. Only. Well, we limit that. that. We limit that to a lower number, but we've opened it for those kind of vendors. Right. And it's. I mean, what they should do is they should have a thread running to do session management, and the thread do, and then the rest of the threads doing transactions, and as uh, as a as a as a as a thread as the as the session times out like through the night. Um, that thread should wake up and then re-log in and re-establish the session because you could use the same session for all those transactions. Yeah. But, you know, that's part of what we talked about with the SDK. Um, that's what the SDK side really helps us as well is if you have a, a, a way that you, you should be interacting, then an SDK and popping that in place and creating those objects, one of the ways you do that is you let it create what we call a connection object. And that connection object is is designed by someone like Jeff, who is very smart, if you can tell by his glasses and stuff, um, that uh, would not allow it to exceed that. But the vendors, you know, at times they don't want to use that. And other times, and to their point, um, they're reusing code across the board, you know. And it was something that was interesting that Alyssa said on the last one, and, and I don't know that you were there, Andrew, but she was genuinely surprised that Cranes didn't write their own mobile software. In her experience with the community banks and the banks and all the other work she's done, this was new to her. Wouldn't you say, Tom? I mean, she seemed... Yeah, she thought we each had our own development shops, yeah. Right, and so so when she figured that out and then figured out what she found one thing in a particular vendor's product that she could go and sort of exploit that across all the other institutions, which has always been my greatest fear because it's pretty easy to go into Google Play and find all of XYZ vendors mobile apps because they have a certain look and feel. Um, they're not going to be that much different. It would, I mean, it's not exceedingly easy, but it wouldn't be super hard either. It's like audio vendors. I mean, the, the back end's almost the same on across the board on the old, right. and so, on the older systems. But my point is, is the way that they're achieving that scale and the cost effectiveness is by reutilizing those, whether it be correlation, uh, whether it be another vendor. And so as a result of that, um, what might work well with vendor X may not, because say correlation is such a newer implementation, and you even mentioned it, Andrew, you said it was the old school way of doing things, is not going to work in a, in a, uh, a modern API uh, connection setting. And so that's a problem we have. Um, it's a problem altogether, uh, because what it does is it creates dysfunctional integration. It also creates the where, back to my point on real-time credit cards and things like that, where um, like Jeff, I, I guarantee you it supports a real-time credit card payment. If the credit card's on his host, which how often is that, right? But if it's not on his host, he does support his side of the real-time transaction, but you gotta support the other side of that in the mobile app. And that's not trivial to do because you don't want people sort of playing games with cash advances and stuff. So it's always been a secondary thought, but what's happening now is the, the members just 
are going to stand for it. They're not, uh, the idea that it's difficult to do isn't going to be a good answer to them. Uh, they're going to say, yeah, but Chime does it. So I'll go talk to Chime. You can't just keep doing business the way you've always done business. You got to. Not, not in this new normal. No. And that's what we talk about these changing strategies. So Andrew, I have a question for you. As you've been back, and, and we're so thankful you are back and all kidding aside, I'm, I'm, I could tell you've been through this. You can see kind of, you said you went through the ringer. I'm, I'm glad to see that you're here again. Um, are you guys kind of looking at the reset from your perspective and what's coming down to you from management on sort of, hey, our strategy shifted. So what have you seen, you know, come your way? Well, a lot kind of aligns with what Jeff said about the, uh, you know, the uh, CRM integrations, because right now, like, you know, we are losing that branch traffic of, you know, the CRM of that, okay, what did they do when they came in? Instead, we just have a bunch of stuff happening on mobile. Um, and right now, you know, working with the, our online banking vendor to write that to custom tables. But if that is all something that, you know, our core could provide for us and then basically make it seamless between the two. So it's really tracking and figure out what's going on. I mean, that's, that's one thing I always talk about, like what happened, how, you know, how, what really happened, what's going on and what's the difference between this year and last year? Because as Tom said, you can't predict right now. There's too, not enough variables, not enough data, not enough information on that. So but a lot of it is agile, like, you know, and You're trying to build more agile interfaces to, to sort of be ready for a shift. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and while doing that, well, maintaining that agility is still maintaining that member touch that making sure you feel, you know, we're the community credit union that, you know, uh, we're still uh, basically providing all the service to the member that, because at, at this point in time, there's no difference between our local credit union and whatever bank they want to go for or FinTech coming on, you know, if everything's going to be going to the digital channels. So how do we differentiate with that? That's a great question. I want to use that moment. Differentiate is an important piece. So Jeff, are you seeing, um, and, and Andrew, you know, Tom, one of the things we talked about was that um, we have to find a way to make FinTech's partners uh, easier because they're going to bring solutions that are going to differentiate. Um, and it can't be this big, well, if this QSO does it, we can all do it. It's going to be Tom going, hey, I found a FinTech that really fits a need in my, in my segment, a niche, or Andrew saying, I found a, a, a FinTech that does that. Um, how are you guys addressing that to make it a little bit easier for, for Andrew to sort of bring that to bear inside his solutions? Or is that more of a home banking piece or is there anything you can play there? Well, from our side, um, you know, we, we, we want to limit all the barriers for integration. We want people to integrate with us. We want right. them to, 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 to bring those new solutions to us. And we, you know, we, we don't, we, we give all of our clients a site license because we say, hey, hook up to whoever you want. Right. You know, right. and then we'll work with any of those vendors and we're vendor agnostic. So, um, you know, we, we like having a huge ecosystem of integrations. It just brings value to all of our clients. And when our clients are ready to integrate with somebody, you know, we're not, we're not going to hinder them. We're going to work with whoever they want. So from our side, we're ready. Bring it on. Well, I, I think, but, but I think what's fascinating is what Andrew said was there's another good opportunity for, um, it seems like there's some things that like the member preferences and some other things that could be centralized yeah. into your system. And they know how quick you are at that. I've seen you do it. I've seen you sit yeah. down and do it. I've sat next to you while you did it. And I'm just wondering if that isn't an SDK or something that we could bring value because one of the problems is, is creating that consistent experience across all the channels when you bring in these fintechs, the only thing that's sort of the same across the board is you. Yeah, and we can add tables. We can add tables all day long. Tables and columns, right. no problem. So yep. easy. Right. But you know, we also put that control in our clients' hands as well. Yeah, I know, and that's why I'm saying you can't have it both ways. But I'm thinking what I, what I think I hear Andrew saying is, hey, there may be some, there may be. Instead of everybody build their own tables, there might be a couple of things that are now coming out of this new business side oh, yeah. strategy that maybe, like we talked about, like monitoring vaccines, that could be less about a custom table and more about something that gets added as an experiential piece to the API to bring cohesiveness to the digital pieces. Oh, we could absolutely. I mean, we do that all the time. We're, you know, if, yeah, I know you do. I know you do. I guess what I'm encouraging is I know you got your client conference coming up, and, and that's really where you're going to get a lot of that feedback. Uh -huh. but, 
it's clear that you guys are ready and willing to make those changes. It's two o'clock. I don't want to keep everybody. Jeff, is there any final thing? And also, where can people uh, find you? And oh yeah, there you go. Uh, a member of working working group for user preferences. Are you committing to that right now, Jeff? Tell the people. <laughs> I'd be happy to have a conversation if I'll set up a meeting if there's um, if there's I'll come. I would like to come I just I've got a lot of problems yeah Cody uh, I'll take this as a follow-up and we could we'd be happy to talk to Andrew if you're up for it and yeah, uh, I know Tom would probably come Tom, Tom always good. likes to talk so um. wow Tom. <laughs> I'm sorry about that buddy. so no absolutely I've, I've heard preferences in the past I just want to make sure that um, we get a good uh, a good um, group of people together that give us the right feedback so that we right. we can have the right items in there. All right. But going yeah. forward, I appreciate the time, John. Thank you for inviting me. You were That's nice me. this time. Usually, you beat me up even harder than me. That's when you're out in the crowd and it's in person. I don't know yeah. why. Should be yeah, when I'm live on stage or something like that. Yeah. I'm usually. Uh, some jabs and and uh, today I did get permission uh, that if you would like to join me in a Twitch style for my for, for my speaking at your event, which I committed to today, that you're allowed to if you so desire. So I would love to have you. I hope that you'll work with me on that. Okay, I'll definitely, let's talk after this. And <laughs> He's not committed. Let's see what happens. <laughs> let's have yeah, then I can heckle John. You know where to find him. If you have any questions, please send them so to me. So Jake, I'll put my uh, jjen at correlationinc.com. If you, if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, and, and I can to, honestly say he'll answer whatever it is. It, it's, it's not just about correlation. So, um, he's, he's always been a huge resource for the credit union industry. All right, guys. Well, thank you everyone and have a great day. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. And Jeff, uh, I'll work with you on this member preference group. Andrew, great to have you back. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.